I'm a professor at the Technical University in Berlin, Germany. Are we alone? Well, we don't know. That's what we want to find out, right? Uh, most likely not. Um, you know, our, our idea about uh, the universe, our solar system, planets, and life seems to indicate that we are not, but we don't have any proof. In the question, are we alone, what, what does we mean to you? We, um, our biosphere, uh, uh, f uh, for most, uh, I guess, humans, and, uh, but also our whole biosphere. So life on Earth. Life on Earth, correct. I see. So, and you think that life on Earth is not alone in the universe? That's correct, yes. And why do you think that? Um, well, uh, that's, uh, that, that's a good question. We don't, uh, we don't know that. Um, but you said probably not. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, probably not, uh, because uh, we think that the origin of life uh, is not that difficult or that's unlikely that we are the only single species in, in the whole universe. How do you evaluate the origin of life to assess that probability? Uh, they, the problem is that there isn't really no probability to assess, uh, at least in my view. Um, there's several different kinds of scenarios. We know chemistry, how it works, how energy flows, and there's a tem some tendency to uh, develop toward uh, larger complexity. However, we still don't know how that all came together, so uh, we, c we can't be really sure that uh, that uh, it could be that the origin of life is extremely rare. It could be that it's very frequent or anywhere in between. But you're assuming that it's not so rare because you said we're probably not alone. Yeah, uh, the thing is that life on Earth must have originated about at least 3.8 billion years ago. My sense of things is that it's more like 4.1 billion years ago. So at the time when uh, water uh, basically first uh, condensed into oceans on our planet, so it must have happened really fast. So that would give us some indication uh, that it's probably not that unlikely. It's no evidence for that, but it seems to indicate that. Have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, unidentif if you put it in the narrow sense as an unidentified flying object, yes. Well, what what was that UFO? When what situation? Um, actually, uh, this one time when I sat with my son on a, a park bench in, in the Yellowstone Park, and we saw uh, something going over over us, uh, and okay. should I continue? Or? We'll just stop for a second. Uh, I better turn that down. <laughs> oh. Uh, so go ahead. go ahead. So we sat in the Yellowstone ta uh, Park and at night looked at the uh, night sky uh -huh. and uh, there seems to be something like a satellite moving across the night sky, which happens fairly often there. We saw several uh, uh, of those satellites and uh, this one was particularly bright and uh, so it moved across the sky and around that mid sky it just stopped and sat there uh -huh. and then the light uh, got dimmer and dimmer as, you know, as if it would be a spaceship basically accelerating away from Earth into space. So what kind of aliens were aboard this spaceship? Well, I don't know whether they even were aliens or whether it was only some kind of a special effect. But until now, I don't know what that actually was. Okay. And what do you know about aliens? Well, no is too strong of a word, right? Um, because since we haven't detected any extraterrestrial life, uh, we don't really know anything of aliens. I mean, we can extrapolate, for example, you, if you are living on a super Earth, you know that is like, for example, five times as massive as Earth. What we would like, what we would probably see, that there's more organisms that are like snakes or very close to the surface. So we can extrapolate under certain planetary conditions what would, we, what would be more likely to see and what kind of maybe different kind of pathways as well. But you've never seen an alien? No, not that I know of. Okay. okay. <laughs> what part of your research is most relevant to assessing the probability of life elsewhere? Um, probably uh, uh, my research into the evolution of life 
And what uh, one of the projects we recently did was looking at uh, uh, transitions of life, at the key innovations, like uh, uh, the eukaryotic cell, multicellularity, intelligence. And what we see is that each of the transitions seems to be, uh, be uh, achieved using different kinds of biochemical pathways. For example, uh, the use of light. There's different kinds of uh, biochemicals, different kinds of pigments with which you can uh, catch light. Or multicellularity is in very different uh, clades of life. So our conclusion was then that all those transitions would be eventually overcome. There's many paths to it. And, um, and basically conquered given enough time. So you think that if we have examples of things on Earth that have evolved multiple times independently, then that is a good candidate for being something that we should expect elsewhere. Correct. The only uh, two transitions where we don't have that is for the origin of life, which is, of course, critical, and the other is a transition toward technological intelligence because this also only happens once on our planet. Well, how about heads? I've heard that heads are monophyletic groups, so therefore they only happen once. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of it that the heads uh, just evolved once. Uh, it possibly could be. Well, but can you it, give, what's your example of something that evolved independently multiple times? Um, for, for example, um, which one, where can I put, makes the best case, for example? Well, eyeballs, flight, for example, e multicellularity, e these are yes, all. Yes, yeah, okay. Which one we you uh, talking about? Let the eyes. eyes. There's diff different types of eyes. There's eyes, insects have diff very different eyes from us, mm. but bo both they function. So the, the point is really that you have to have the functionality. The biochemistry is not that important as long as you have the same functionality. The biochemistry, is, but, but the common ancestor of us and flies had the biochemistry and that is still in the basis of our eye and flies' eyes. Uh, so it's not independent. Uh, but, uh, but the eye evolved independently. Well, not if the biochemistry at the fundamental part of it did not. Well, if you go far enough to back, then of course you always have that, you know. Right, right. Then we can say, oh, okay, it's your DNA or RNA or so, yes. Um, but uh, the eye, the human eye, uh, developed independently from the insect eye, and there's a couple of other eyes, too. But, but how can you say that if the basic biochemistry of both eyes is the same and had a common ancestor, was present in the common ancestor? Are you pretending that the biochemistry, the fundamental biochemistry of a human eye, is not important? Well, well of course, the biochemistry is important, otherwise it wouldn't function. Yeah, you you right. have, to have the right molecules together. Um, uh, but it depends how far you go back. Of course, if you say, okay, uh, it has to be, you know, there has to be proteins, there has to be DNA, well, you they have to the common ancestor. molecules. That's a common ancestor if you go all the way back. Well, it was about, I guess, I don't know, 700 million years or something. And the common ancestor had presumably some biochemical uh, pigments, photosensitive pigments. And both the descendants had those same pigments, and so. <coughs> Why would you call eyeballs, which both rely on that biochemistry, independent of each other? Uh, because if, uh, in, uh, because uh, if you look insects and you know mammals also, they evolved independently. So they use maybe some of the same molecules. That's correct, but uh, the evolution of the eye as a functional unit was independent. Okay, and uh, what is habitability? Well, habitability is uh, uh, for life to live, uh, if possible for life to live in a certain type of environment. So if you have a planet and the planet is habitable, it can, it has the potential to host life. And do you have a definition of life? Uh, <laughs> well, y yeah, I do have a, uh, there exist many different kinds of definitions. The problem is a little bit to distinguish between a life and a living system. Um, my favorite uh, definition is that uh, you, do, you have to have uh, you have to have basically three things. 
you have to have a, a genetic system or some kind of a system for reproduction, and that's the information code is uh, uh, moving from one uh, from one generation to the other. You have to have uh, um, some kind of a membrane or semi-permeable membrane that uh, you have uh, that so that the li uh, that the uh, uh, cell or any kind of life form can be in thermodynamic disequilibrium with the outside environment. And you have to have something uh, what, uh, uh, where you create energy, so that you, which is usually uh, that part is taken up by proteins and life okay. as we know it. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? Uh, I, I think it's a very important question philosophically as well. Um, why? Because, <laughs> well, maybe it's a um, good question. <laughs> Why? Um, it, I don't know. It's how we understand ourselves as uh, living entities, I think. And uh, it, it would be a whole waste of space to have the un all universe and we are the only living uh, entity in it. Um, a waste of space, so life is better than non-life then? Uh, I don't know whether uh, one thing is better or we not. You said it would be a waste of space. It would be a waste of space if you think the whole universe and we are the only uh, living entity in this little corner of a galaxy there. Why would that be a waste? I mean, uh, with all the stars and planets, and it, it seems to be uh, contradictory to the scientific uh, principle that everything, you know, if, if we have habitable conditions and uh, uh, the physical and chemical underpinning, we assume that there's somewhere else in the universe as well, and so that you would have habitable planets. And it would be uh, uh, kind of odd if you know, you have naturally um, uh, the origin of life or life persisting in this part of the universe, in this part of the galaxy, and that this would not be possible in some other part of the universe with the same chemical, physically, physical, and presumably also biological laws are valid. Well, the sa let's, I, let's suppose that there are these other Earths out there and lots of water and all the recipes. But, you know, English and German are probably unique to this planet. We shouldn't go looking for them. So they're kind of quirky things. And it would be silly to go looking for an English-speaking alien. But you're say saying, therefore, that life is not as quirky a thing as a particular human language like German or English. Well, I, I think this is a good example of the English and German. Because, yes, English is unique, German is unique. But they both have the same function. They function from communicating from one species to the other. And so that's what I'm basically saying. Yeah, but, wait, but they have common origin, though. And uh, in that case, they have a common origin. That's, that, well, in that's almost true. All cases but <laughs> let's take uh, you know, Chinese and German or something, or oh. Chinese and English. Well, the humans for, have a common origin. Uh, and common, well, the common origin of Chinamen <laughs> and Germans was speaking some kind of language, right? Uh, well, uh, if, you, yeah, if you go far enough back, then you always well, have something commonality. Right, but when you go far enough back, you're trying to see, does that common ancestor have any part of the trait that you're interested in saying was independent? And if the answer is yes, then they're not independent, it seems to me. Um, well, it comes then back to the core question, you know, is our bio if, if you go that way, is our biochemistry unique, right? Mm -hmm. it, does life have to have proteins? Does it have to have amino acids? Does it, does it have to have phospholipids? Does it have to be DNA or RNA, right? Or whether can, there can be some kind of other genetic code, say that it's really independently originated, and say, okay, this life uses... Uh, well, I don't want to say PNA because maybe PNA was the pre, uh, ancestor of RNA, right? But something different, what is not, uh, was never used by life on Earth. Uh -huh. Now, now you uh, study astrobiology presumably because you're, you're curious about it. Now, do you think that makes you a better person? 
N no, I don't think so. <laughs> and why do you do it? Uh, because I'm personally interested in it. And why are you interested in it? Because I like to understand nature. I like to know what this is all about. And astrobiology, you know, addresses the big questions. Hmm. And so people who aren't curious about what it's all about and just would like to make money and have children and eat food, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's not for you. Well, ob obviously, I need some money to live from, too, <laughs> okay. and I, I have to consume food as well. Uh -huh. But uh, that's not where my passion lies. Right. OK. Um, let's see. So we talked about that. Um, do you think if we replayed the tape of life that, uh, that humans would evolve again? Uh, Human-like intelligence? Um, not humans. You, you wouldn't have I exactly the same thing, but pr probably uh, something with this kind of functionality. Uh, whether humans, uh, or whether technological intelligence would arise again of, on this planet, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I would sh I, I'm sure, uh, I feel, co let's say, uh, you cannot be sure really without a proof, but I would feel confident that animal or plant-like life, or at least life with this type of a function, would arise again. Whether it would be technological intelligence, whether we would go so far and get there again, I'm not sure, because that seems to be uh, quite a little bit more dicey or rare. So pl you're happy to say, you happily expect plants and animals and fungi on other planets, though? Uh, uh, well, I don't know whether we would call them animals, but they would have basically the same functions, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Yuri Milner recently gave $100 million to help SETI searches to improve the sensitivity of radio telescopes. Um, if I gave you $100 million, what did, would you do if, with the caveat of you have to answer the question, are we alone, or have to help answer the question, are we alone? Uh, no one ever did a proposal like that to me, so uh, that uh, would be a little bit... Uh, to consider or think about it. Um, uh, I, I think uh, what I w would do is uh, uh, trying to get missions um, uh, to Mars, to uh, put a life detection uh, instrumentation on Mars, a life detection mission to Mars. And also, I w would send, uh, I don't know what I would call the life detection, but uh, some kind of uh, a robotic instrumentation, uh, instrumentation with uh, quite a bit of sophistication to Titan. Titan and Mars. Titan and Mars, exactly. Not Europa and Enceladus. Um, well, I would have to put some more the emphasis. You know, if if you're giving me another hundred mm. million, uh, many, uh, then we can make perhaps. So you wouldn't you wouldn't invest any of it in the SETI. Um, no, not, uh, I, I don't th think at this point, uh, uh, but it may be a bias a little bit on my expertise because I wouldn't know exactly, okay, wi which frequency to use. I mean, there's searches already at some dominant, like the hydrogen line uh, searches being done. So I wouldn't uh, necessarily know what to add there. But from my personal expertise, I would like to, uh, really finally have a life detection uh, mission to Mars. And I see Titan as especially promising as well because there's so many organic molecules and uh, you have a liquid hydrocarbon lakes on, on the surface. So um, it does not mean that it necessarily would have life on Titan, but we co could see how far organic evolution would have in this kind of really alien environment with now free oxygen and now basic now liquid water there would have moved toward, toward life. We would have a really understanding. And actually, if we would find life on Titan, it would be exotic. So we would uh, nearly be sure to have a second o uh, origin there, which would inform us we are not alone. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and when you teach astrobiology, what are the biggest misconceptions that students have? Uh, I, th I think one is with a habitable zone because I, th I think that it's habitable per se and that there's probably a life on it. 
while it only says that it has a, a likely liquid uh, water on its surface, which doesn't mean necessarily that it's habitable or could be far away from that being habitable. So an overestimation of the potential of habitability or habitable zones. Uh, yeah, I, I think the term is uh, a misconception how it evolved. Uh, I mean, at the beginning, it made sense how it was termed like this, but right now it's a misconception. It's a misconception the other way as well, too, because if you only uh, make your judgment on habitable zone, Titan is not in the habitable zone, Europa is not in the habitable zone, but there could be life. So it goes both ways. Any other misconceptions? Uh, I, th I think um, we'll see whether something else comes to, uh, comes to my mind. Um, uh, nothing that that I th think at this point. How about point religious as challenges to astrobiology in German? Are German students uh, at all religious in the sense that they do not like being told things that disagree with the fundamental religious things that they've learned? Um, uh, I, I didn't experience that much, um, uh, much German. at all in Germany. In the US, in, in, in the US <coughs> more. And uh, I had recently a Pakistan uh, in my class, uh, one from Pakistan, and uh, he was, was a little bit different. He was a creationist, so right. he had some issues with it. Yes. Do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Um, you will be open-minded, try to be creative, and get some kind of a, a base. Uh, in one of the sciences that are relevant uh, to astrobiology. Because at least in Germany, you cannot study astrobiology you know, for a bachelor or something like this. And I think in most countries, you can. It's the only place, maybe the University of Washington, Seattle, where you can do it. Maybe there's a few other, most you cannot. So it, it's important to get some expertise in some other relevant uh, subject area. What kind of aliens would you like to find? <laughs> what I like to find. Well, I never get those questions. <laughs> what I like to find. Um, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I think my preferences would be too to find a complex life rather than only simple life, and preferably uh, uh, some life that you can still in some way communicate with and have one-to-one uh, -one exchange like we do have right now. Okay, and uh, do you have a favorite solution to the Fermi's paradox? Um, you know, I, I kind of uh, try to make myself free of what I personally like or what I not, and just to be to be absolutely objective to things. What is your most objective solution to uh, the Fermi's uh, paradox? Well, uh, I, I think uh, it's a little bit like uh, that uh, life, or even intelligent, technological intelligent life may be common, but space is so vast, and it would be very unlikely that we find some kind of other civilization or you, uh, technological intelligence in our neighborhood that is on exactly the same kind of uh, technology, technology level as we are. Like, for example, uh, uh, in my classes, I often say, you know, if you go to Berlin or you know to Sydney or uh, wherever with a walkie-talkie and put a certain frequency on, you know, and want to communicate and uh, go through the town, you probably don't get anyone on that channel, you know, responsive to you. And the reason is because everyone is sitting on Facebook and communicating with some other type of technology. So that's the solution to Fermi's paradox. Well, the solution is in that way that it's very unlikely to have a, in our galactic neighborhood, let's say the uh, next 50 light years away or even 100 light years away, uh, one civilization that is exactly on the same level. I mean, we're using radio telescopes the last 100 years, and uh, Earth's age is 4.6 billion years. So it, it's probably very unlikely. Are we alone? Uh, uh, my sense of things is, most likely not, but we cannot prove it that we are not alone. And that is part of it, why we do what we do. But, and why do you think most likely we're not alone? 
because it's, from my scientific understanding, it's uh, given that the same chemical, physical, and bio presumably biological laws holds over the whole universe, it would be very odd indeed if it would be unique. That doesn't mean that it's impossible. I mean, it's just still a, a possibility. It may be, s I mean, in essence, we cannot evaluate the probability because I think uh, uh, from a, a now a number of one, if it was one example, we can't really say how likely is that or how not likely is it. So it's, it's obviously, it has to be some kind of subjective. Um, but having said that, it, it, it would seem to be quite odd.